Hey everyone, welcome back to Vassals of Kingsgrave's Agatha Christie reread. Today we are on episode 35, which is kind of unbelievable, and we are discussing Toward Zero, which was originally published in June 1944 in the US and July 1944 in the UK. My name is Bina007, I'll be your host today, and this is not a mini pod. We debated back and forth on whether it should be, and we'll probably get into it in the spoiler section of why this is now a full episode. But I'm joined today by Pat. Hi there, 2.0 in the Discord. Yes, come and join us on the Vassals of King's Grave Discord. If you check us out on our YouTube channel or on X, you'll find a link to join us. Um, okay, as X, always... X, formerly known as Twitter. I, I, I'm still sticking Twitter. to Twitter. Actually, I've now foregone Twitter and joined Threads, so maybe we'll have to set up a Vox Threads account. Okay, so as as usual, folks, we're going to discuss this spoiler-free up until our little ITV Poirot music, and then in the spoiler fill section at the end, we'll do solutions and maybe get more into how we're rating this book. But to start off, um, Pat, what did you make of this murder mystery? Um, it, it, I think this is a good Christie. I think a lot of Christie people will enjoy this, but I don't class it as top tier for me. It doesn't quite hit the heights, and we talked about this on the Discord, and I, I think I have more affection for other books of hers that I've read recently because I just think they give me higher highs, um, whereas this just seems to be just clicking along at, you know, average to better than average most of the way, but it doesn't ever soar. It, it, like, I, I, I'm never tremendously affected by anything. I don't catch a passage and go, oh, wow, that's that's struck me. And I, I, I think... It's very, it's a very competent novel, you know, um, and that quite a bit of it is well done, but it's not exceptional, I would say. I completely agree. And maybe I would even be a little bit harsher. I mean, I think it clicks along, competent are all the sort of adjectives I would use. And then when we get into the spoiler fill section, I'll explain why I think the solution is both psychologically believable, but I think the kind of the, the nuts and bolts and cranks in terms of how you get there, to me, were literally incredible. So that really undermined it for me. I find that I can forgive a story mediocre characterization, but when the plot mechanics I find far-fetched, it really does it for me. But it must be said, Pat, that we are apparently in the minority. So according to, you know, if you go to the Agatha Christie wiki site, or if you go to read articles on this book or indeed listen to the wonderful all about agatha pod this is often said to be one of her finest stories um it's one of the stories that people really admire uh, that's well, kind I'm of just... why we've done a full pod right because i think on our own maybe yeah. this might have been a mini pod so yes yeah I, 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 like when we were discussing on the discord I, I said well maybe because everybody um in the, uh, the sort of the christie fandom out there um treats it with such respect maybe we should give an explanation for why we don't think it is is top tier. But, I mean, I, I think you're probably more severe on it than I am mm -hmm. um, because I think I recognise it's got positives. And when I was listening to the All About Agatha podcast, they rated it above Thad Cypress. And for me, that's the sort of borderline it sits on. But for me, it's below it. Agreed. So if I was ranking them, I would say it's close to it, but it's just not there. I, it's, yeah. Sad Cypress has got elements in it that I find more engaging and entertaining um, and interesting, whereas this one, maybe it just doesn't, it, it, it doesn't push past it. Yeah, me. although maybe uh, interestingly for me, both suffer a little bit from incredibility of plot mechanics, but I think the characters somehow grab me more and the tragedy yes. of the situation in Sad Cypress. Yeah, that's a very good comparison. Anyway, folks, if you haven't read this and want a taste of what it's about, maybe pique your interest and suck you in. This is the, the book blurb. What is the connection between a failed suicide attempt, a wrongful accusation of theft against a schoolgirl, and the romantic life of a famous tennis player? To the casual observer, apparently nothing. But when a house party gathers at Gulls Point, the seaside home of an elderly widow, early events come to a dramatic head. So effectively, what's going on here is the elderly widow in question, very wealthy, as is always the case in Agatha Christie, there's often a legacy to be played for, is murdered at a cliff-top seaside house. And the person who comes to investigate is not Hercule Poirot or Miss Marple. It's actually Superintendent Battle, who we've seen in four previous books. This is the first one where he's really the sole investigator and he's he's in the vicinity. He's visiting his nephew, who's also a much more junior policeman, and agrees to help out. So that's the sort of the setup 
of the book. Um, Agatha Christie herself, she wrote, she kept these amazing notebooks, um, which she sketched out many, well, presumably all of her novels, although not all of the notebooks survive. And this one, um, she has a very detailed sketch of the plot of the book. Um, she even drew a map of the coastline around Gulls Point, which plays a very important part in the story, the getting to and from this rather inaccessible house that has a sheer cliff face on one side of it. So this is one where she was very proud of the plotting of the book. And another interesting little side point is that she uh, dedicated it to Robert Graves, the author of I, Claudius. And that is the namesake or the inspiration for hashtag Greg, aka Claudius the Fool on these forums. So (laughs) um, (laughs) there you go. Also one of my favourite novelists and favourite books and favourite TV shows indeed. So any of you I, Claudius, Cluckler Claudius fans... uh, that's who this book's dedicated to. <laughs> wow. The novel was published in July 43, so we're still in the thick of the war when people receive this book. And this book doesn't really have anything of the war in it, I'm trying to think. But the world has changed, right? I mean, divorce now occurs. It is tolerated. That's very different from the early 20s when Agatha started writing these novels. So you can be divorced and, and live. Ladies do not leave the table for port anymore. <laughs> for all you Downton Abbey fans. <laughs> We have ascended, we women, to the, to the point where we can now enjoy port after dinner with the gentlemen. The wonders of feminism. In the, so, in, in the summer, the men no, are no longer required to dress for dinner. Uh, it's plain to wear the lounge suit. So. Horrifying. Horrifying. I remember when Lord Grantham in Downton Abbey bemoans the introduction of the dinner jacket. Why aren't we wearing tails for dinner? So this is, this is how far <laughs> standards are slipping. And Agatha Christie, in real life, her only grandchild, Matthew Pritchard, is born in this period, which is rather sweet. Um, Okay, so back in the real world, which um, this novel is very studiously trying to avoid, August 1943, German and Italian forces evacuate Sicily and Germany loses the Battle of Kursk. September 43, Italy surrenders and the Nazi puppet Republic of Salo is founded. October 43, Italy declares war on Germany, an interesting turn of events. (laughs) Half the inmates thankfully escape from Sobibor. The Burma Railway is completed, a horrifying episode in history. And Chiang Kai-shek is sworn in as the head of the government in China. November 43, Axion Ernefest, the largest single day massacre of Jews in Poland. Absolutely appalling. 43,000 shot dead. Just horrible to contemplate. Kiev liberated from the Germans and the Allied bombing of Berlin begins. December 1943. Uh, General Eisenhower becomes Supreme Commander of Allied Forces Europe. We also have, incredibly controversially to this day, the Bengal Famine. And in lighter news, Jacques Cousteau invents the first scuba gear, the Aqualung. Uh, Moving to January 44, the tide of the war really is turning now. In January 44, the siege of Leningrad was lifted and the Battle of Monte Cassino begins. In March of 44, for all you economist people out there, of whom I am one, Friedrich Hayek publishes The Road to Serfdom. For all these cinema fans, of which I'm also one, Casablanca wins Best Picture. In Britain, the prohibition on married women working as teachers is lifted. My goodness, <laughs> you can be a teacher and be married. Why wouldn't you have been a teacher and married? That's just so bizarre. Um, for all you World War II movie fans out there, The Great Escape from Stalag Luft Three takes place and then will become an absolutely phenomenal film which will in turn inspire Chicken Run, which is also a great film. And in Sweden, this shocked me, Tetra Pak was invented. That kind of feels early. I don't know. I, I think it would probably take me about 80 years to open one as well. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been able to get my thumbs around them. I know. It does help having having being a girl with slightly longer nails. April 44, the Japanese launch Operation Ishigo offensive in Central and South China. May 44, the Soviets liberate, quote unquote, Crimea. Germany invades Hungary and deports Jews to Auschwitz. Um, June 1944, Hans Asperger publishes his paper on Asperger syndrome. Kind of interesting. The Allies Mm. take Rome. Enigma messages are being decoded real time. What an achievement of code breakers. June the 6th is D-Day. So by the time this book is released, D-Day is upon us. V-1 bombers target London. US forces land in Japan. And Finland, mighty, mighty Finland, resists Soviet attack. And July 1944, Germans are driven out of Lithuania. We have the Bretton Woods Agreement for all of you economic history fans. Tojo resigns as Prime Minister of Japan. Operation of Valkyrie to assassinate Hitler fails. And the Soviets liberate the Camp Majinek. 
So it's all kicking off um, in the war. The tide has 100% turned against both Japan and Germany. Italy's out of the war effectively. Um, but yet this war is going to rumble on for another year with horrible, mm. horrible consequences for those still captured by the Germans and in particular the Jews and other persecuted peoples in Europe. But yeah, definitely feels like things have turned the corner. But also... Yeah, the, 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 I just wanted to comment on the Asperger one, because again, oh. that, that's something I only became recently aware of. I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off on a tangent. So I, I've been watching a great K-drama called Extraordinary Attorney Wu, mm -hmm. and she has Asperger's in that, and she mentions that it actually, I mean, I never realised this, it, 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 it came out, he was actually um, a German doctor. Was he? Okay. And he used this method to define um, who deserved to live, basically. Oh, God. That's, so so that, that's basically how it came about. This is how people start started to categorize the, the syndrome, you know. I, I, like, I was gobsmacked when I, I, I found out. It's like you come across these things and you almost feel guilty yeah. for not knowing more about it. That's horrific. About the history behind this sort of stuff. So Yeah. Oh, that's so sad. Um although obviously helpful to have the science, but not what it was used yes. for. It's just it's yeah. just yeah, so conflicting, isn't it? Yeah. It's always weird when I do these little summaries because you have these really horrific things happening. And then yeah. at the same time it's like in Casablanca one best picture. It's sort of yeah. it's always jarring to realise that kind of when all of these really horrific things are happening and yet pop culture continues, science continues, yeah. you know, Jacques Cousteau inventing his aqualung, um, life continues and Yeah, it keeps moving. Things yeah, move and Agatha Christie yeah. while serving as a, a dispensing pharmacist in a in a hospital in the centre of London being you know, when you read V1 Bombers target London, well, that's targeting people like Agatha Christie, ordinary people yeah. who are trying to work and in London, I, and yet she's still churning out books. It's yeah, but I, phenomenal. I, I, think, I think you said this in previous pods, and I, it, it might be why she wasn't examining the um, details about the war too much. It's almost like she's doing this as a service mm. because people need to get through, you know, the day, you know, with all the horror that's going on around them. Sometimes they need something that's going to lift them. Absolutely. Out of it, take them away from it, give them something else to think about, you know. Which is often why we still read her now and why she endures in popularity. But mm. I do think it's admirable that she didn't resort to doing propaganda because great yes. filmmakers of this time, great orators, even George Orwell, right, they did do radio and written and filmic propaganda. She doesn't, like, she doesn't write evil characters that are the Hun. So no. if she doesn't have the war, she at least doesn't have... She doesn't have it symmetrically. Like there aren't gallant yeah, uh, evil Germans. You know? I mean, I, 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 I know what you're saying, I, 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 but I, like, yes, there was some very tacky and cheap propaganda. But like, like um, Lawrence Olivier's Henry V was also mm, a propaganda movie propaganda. that was made. Uh, yeah, and yeah. I, I never, it never struck me as taking cheap shots at people. You know, no. I, I, it, it was you know positive more propaganda fun. jingo yeah. like positive nationalistic jingo yeah, yeah yeah rousing speeches about how you've got to rally together to mm. you know move forward and stuff like Band that rather brothers. than let's degrade the the opposition and, and treat them as subhuman you mm. know um as a way to motivate ourselves so anyway it's it's a, a, a big thing all yeah. right, well, let's get into the story. So the whole thing is set at Gull Point, this beautiful seaside clifftop house um, owned by Camilla Lady Tresillian. So she's a widow in her early 70s, not in tremendously good health. She is, I don't know, do you have any, I didn't put down any quotes about her. Do you, do you have a, a good or bad impression of Lady Tresillian, Pat? I have a great impression of Lady Tresillian. I, I think she's a fabulous character, and, and I like it when um, English literature has these grand old dames. I've mentioned it in previous podcasts. I like these acerbic old women who say what they like and like what they say. Um, and <laughs> I, I think she's um, brilliant. We, we get too little of her, you know. Yes. Um, and uh, I, I find it entertaining when she's talking about Neville's crazy idea to bring his ex-wife and his wife on holiday at the same time. And uh, and the fact that she's only going to do it because of her, her husband's memory and how he was devoted to, to Neville Strange. So I, I, I think she's great. Uh, yeah. You know. And she's very fair minded, right? And very loyal. And she's very, yes. for an old woman, she's not naive about 
how you know relationships work and sexual jealousy and all of that stuff and she just seems like really perceptive yeah and really just yeah like a really would have been nice to know her more i think as you say so yeah Karen I, I think she's stuff. she's got a great uh, a great tone phrase as well whenever she disapproves of something um she just puts it down to it it's the modern way <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know but not in a stuff gonna... way just in a sort of a you know <laughs> yeah we've got to get on with life this is the yeah. modern way you know Neville wants to bring his ex-wife and his current wife on holiday i suppose it's the modern thing we'll just let it go exactly so... exactly um so staying with camilla lady trisillian permanently is her companion mary alden i think this is now one of several ladies companions that we've had in these novels definitely something of the time mm -hmm. She's in her mid-thirties, and to quote, to have Mary, who is a well-read, intelligent woman, is marvellous. She has really a first-class brain, a man's brain. <laughs> she has read widely and deeply, and there is nothing she cannot discuss. So maybe showing Camilla's Lady Tressilian's uh, rather old-fashioned attitudes there, describing a good brain as a man's brain. But we get the impression that Mary Alden is very capable and, and you know, a good companion to have around. Any views on Mary? Yeah, a, a, a few. Uh, and this will tie into um, whether the book was of its time um, mm. and how it's aged and how it reflects society then and society now. So, like, I think she is the sort of woman who was probably done a disservice by the time she was born in. I think if she'd been given more opportunity, she would have achieved more. I think she's somebody who's been restricted in her opportunities, which Absolutely. is why she's now um, a lady's companion. But um, Battle, when he turns up and he is, is sizing everybody up, he, he tells us that um, she's a competent woman and you won't catch her off guard easily. Yeah. And uh, then when he's examining her room, he sees travel books, no photos. She doesn't live in the past. Practical, obviously has a desire to travel. You know, so she's somebody who's had a very restrict. She's she's been restricted in her opportunities. So yeah, and it does battle credit that he sees her intelligence as well. Yeah, he doesn't sort of um, dismiss her casually. But visiting yeah. the house, oh my word! Let's get to uh, Lady Tressilian's ward in some way, Neville Strange. <laughs> he is a handsome athlete and tennis player. He's thirty three years old. Um, this is not the first type of character of this description that we've come across in Agatha Christie books either. So. No, it is not. He's known for his gentlemanly fair play on the tennis court. Mm -hmm. um, he's actually the former ward of Lady Tressilian's late husband, but mm -hmm. it is understood that he will inherit her wealth when she dies. Um, he, as, as you've already alluded to, has two wives who are also there. So the first one is his first wife. She is Audrey Strange, age 32, very cool, very quiet, you know, very hard to read. She was orphaned very young and raised with her cousins and aunt, the Royds. So mm -hmm. she's already staying with, with Lady Tresillian and they seem very fond of each other. But Neville Strange has thrown her over for a much younger wife, who's just 23 years old, so a decade younger, and she's called Kay Strange. And she seems the polar opposite of Audrey, just, you know, very pretty, very sort of a bit more of a temper, out for fun. Um, so it's quite the triangle and totally orcs, as we'd say now. And Lady <laughs> Tresillian's like, I guess this is the modern way that Neville feels he can bring his new wife with him. But Neville also seems to have a lot of affection for Audrey or certainly it, it's just a very weird setup. He seems to have far more in common with Audrey than he does with Kay. Yes. Yeah. Thoughts and feelings on this this trio, this awkward trio. Um, I, um, I, I, I think um, Neville is this um, stereotypical man from from Christie novels. And I think this is probably one of the weaknesses of this novel is we've seen this character before mm. um maybe if you're going to criticize christy as a writer i i don't think she does her men apart from maybe poirot her men don't tend to be as interesting as the female characters Agreed. whereas i think audrey and Kay are great particularly mm -hmm. Kay. i have a real affection for Kay, and i i thought this might be another one where we have a disagreement about because she reminds me of magdalena lee from um hercule poirot's christmas yes, she's yeah she's young she's attractive she has married somebody probably because they've got money mm -hmm. um but I, I, I love how she's so forthright i think 
the yeah, she's no top. pushover, is she, for a young girl? No. I mean, she's no. prima- she's actually about the most fun to read, I think, because she, yeah, she has say. life, has real yeah. life and vibrancy to her. So no, I I really loved liked her as a character. Yeah, actually. but she for me, she she brings a raw emotion to this book with her petty jealousy. She's got vanity, she's spiteful, but it's all engaging. And there's that great bit where they fight over the Sports Illustrated. Yeah. Neville walks in and goes, the paper's arrived, dear. And Audrey goes, oh, thanks. And Kay goes, give it to me. I want it. I want it. And like, I was disappointed in the All About Agatha uh, podcast because they said that they felt that she was poorly drawn, you know, and quite a shallow character. And no, I, I didn't see that. I thought she had real I... depth. I was like, because she's got so many gears. And um, I loved the way that she described Audrey. So, um there's a bit where they have a fight and uh, she turns around and she says she's a Audrey Strange, wave-faced, mewling, double-crossing little cat. She just doesn't <laughs> pull any punches. And I, I, I said, the bits of, of this book that I enjoyed the most were the bits that had um, Kay Stranger. You know? I would have loved, I'd love to have seen her being played by a younger Natalie Dormer. It would have been really fun. She's yeah. got a lot of yeah. that spice. Um, and both of these women, both Kay and Audrey, have a gentleman in attendance who rather likes them. So there's a chap called Ted Latimer who's been a friend of Kay's since they were in their mid-teens, and he's sort of hanging around, sniffing around. And then Thomas Royd is Audrey's cousin. On vacation from his work in Malaysia, like Audrey, he is a, a man of few words, so he's also sort of dancing attendance on her. So they both have a, a potential love interest, but are still very much in the sort of the orbit of Neville Strange. Any thoughts on Ted or Thomas? Yeah, well, um, Thomas, again, he's somebody who probably Battle um, describes best. So he, he sizes him up after having a look around his room. He said, um, this guy's conservative, sentimental, and used to having servants clean up after him. Mm. Um, and when he sees him, he said, he's a dark horse with a, a gammy arm, poker face, an inferiority complex, as likely as not, which I, I, I thought probably got Thomas got Roy. Absolutely right. You know, yeah, spot on. pretty unpleasant. Um, yeah, he's not a very engaging character, um, you know. And uh, again, it, it's probably where the book has aged um, in that I think in it, at, at the time it was written, his stoicism would have been seen as um, a virtue. You know, he would have been seen as a very steadfast and loyal character. And this is the sort of thing that we appreciate. But um, he's just not very engaging to read. He's like, you know, quite quite dull, really. Yeah, and also, I, I think he's meant to be seen as dull. I think Neville's meant to be seen as rather dashing. And... Yeah, but I, I, I think there, there, there are times when you're writing these characters where to make it more interesting, you can introduce an element of humour yes. through them. And it, it, there's none of that. He's just, he, he, he's, quite, he's quite stunted. Um, Ted mm. Latimer, I thought, was interesting as well because he is very much seen as the outsider. And again, a lot of um, character traits that I think are portrayed negatively for the audience in the 40s when this was written would maybe be seen differently now. You know, he's young and he's dashing. And when I was reading it and the way that he was hanging around with Kay, I, I was getting very much um, Richard Gere from American Gigolo vibes. <laughs> yes. So I, I was thinking, I, I'd actually like to follow Ted Latimer's story more here than maybe um, Thomas Royd's. You know, it, I yeah. think he's got a lot more going on. So, um, and there's that bit where um, it turns out that uh, when Battle's doing his investigation or whatever, that um, one of the reasons they couldn't track Ted Latimer down was that he was um, engaged with an older lady, you know, because he was entertaining. <laughs> He does so, have a, he does have an element of gigolo about him. We can get yeah. into whether that's progressive or regressive, but definitely I think that's implied that um, a little bit like that ballroom dancer um, yeah. that we saw in a prior novel that he's maybe entertaining the ladies. Yeah, uh, he genuinely likes Kay. I think I think they get on like a house on fire, and they think yes. everyone else is an old dry stick. Yeah, and it? and genuinely hates Neville as well yeah, because exactly. because because Neville is married to Kay. So. Absolutely. And then we have a, a couple of other characters. So Mr. Treves, the family solicitor, as always happens when mm. there's going to be a will. Um, we have a really fascinating character called Angus McWhorter, who, before the events of the novel really begin, had attempted suicide very sadly from the cliff near Lady Tresillian's home. And he survives and sort of in a rather melancholy way goes back to the site of where he attempted suicide and becomes really someone who observes or part of the solution to the crime. It's really fascinating as a character, I think, and a depiction of um, a mental health struggle in this era. 
Um, we then have the, the formal inspectors, Inspector James Leach, Battle's nephew, and Superintendent Battle, who's vacationing with his nephew. But we, we get some more backstory. So he's actually a husband and father of five kids. And his youngest child, his, his daughter, has been accused of committing a crime at school and hauled into the headmistress and has confessed under duress but didn't actually do it. And that's sort of the opening of the novel and it's sort of playing on Superintendent Battle's mind. Any thoughts on any of these characters? I mean, maybe Angus McWhirter is quite an interesting one. And then Battle? Um, well, the, the, the Battle's daughter thing was interesting because that sort of ties back to Stad Cyprus and this idea of Well, a lot of it does, doesn't it, this novel? Yeah. There are think echoes, I think, to that. I thought that was interesting. Um, Angus McWhirter, you'll have to talk about him more because I've just written plot device given a backstory <laughs> and left it at that. The only other thing that leapt out to me was um, sort of midway through it, he gets a job, which is the reason why he decides to go back to Gold's Point. And I, I thought that was the my favourite passage in the book because Christy, she's got this great comedic flair when she chooses to exercise it and she yes. doesn't in this book very often. But the, there's a great bit where McWhorter goes to meet Lord Connelly about a job and, and Agatha sets the stage and she's like, August 10th, Lord Connelly, that rich and eccentric peer, was sitting at the monumental desk, which was his special pride and pleasure. It had been designed for him at tremendous expense and the whole room was subordinate to it. The effect was terrific and it was only slightly marred by the addition of Lord Connelly himself, an insignificant and rotund little man, completely dwarfed by the... Di- the desk's magnificence and I just magnificence and I just thought that like when she's on point she's brilliant and uh, that that and that was priceless but <laughs> there was so little of it I just so uh, um that that was my highlight with McWhorter as he goes Very into good. Sea Lord so well that nicely takes us into whether this book is progressive or regressive I think one of the more progressive elements is the fact that we have a character who has attempted suicide. And I think the way in which it's treated is rather sympathetic. Like it, it's not condemned. He's given sympathy. And we, I think this comes from an author who herself, you know, we talked about the fugue state and going through severe depression at the time of her divorce or leading up to her divorce, that this is still a period that was very kind of heavily Christian and where attempts on your life were not understood in the same way as they are today. Mm. Um, and and, and the think, nurse who, who yeah. speaks to the water it, it explains um, why he shouldn't kill himself because of that. Yeah. You know, she actually says the Lord might have a purpose for you. You know, But it's so, not done in a pompous or it's no. not done in a judgmental way. It's yeah. I just felt that actually, I mean, I've never done it if you did a comparative review of books at this time discussing attempted suicide. It just felt this was... I felt it was a sympathetic rendering, if a brief one, because he is a side character, really. But I thought that was rather progressive. On the regressive side, uh, both Treves and Lady Tresillian, I felt their gender attitudes and even the sort of mention of phrenology was very, very old school. Yeah. Poor um, Ted Latimer. <laughs> yeah. he, has, he has a skull that has only been seen once before in a man who murdered somebody. <laughs> You know, um, that's what Treves has uh, identified. You're like, oh dear. But um, that, I, I think there's a, a broader aspect to this, and I, I wanted to, to to mention it because um, I get the feeling now that I've read about a dozen of these. Agatha is now using um, society's um, opinions, you know, the judgments, um, mm. and, and um, to um, misdirect us. So she's, I think you mentioned this in the last one, she's taking people's biases and um, putting them out there as statements of fact so that we are going up wild goose chases. But I do think as well, um, coming back to Battle's daughter, um, she um, is almost criticised um, people's, I don't know, their ability to ju- be judgmental and self-important and, you know, um, sure of how correct they are with without... Um, any sort of shred of evidence because she um, has decided that Battle's daughter is guilty of these petty thefts at the school because mm. she has used psycho um, psychoanalysis and psychology, the greater, you know, the latest methods of criminology to deduce it. And Battle's looking at it going, she's just an old fraud. I don't believe what, 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 you, what you're talking about. And I think Christie's used that as a, a way of mm. almost critiquing society you know to say people are jumping on all these new ideas but they don't really understand them and they're mm. using them as explanations for why they're right so it, it, it it's like she's playing with people's um or, or public opinions you know 
um, in service of the plot. Completely agree. And this is why we love Agatha, right? Because she she's so, yeah, she's using genre confe- convention to play with and reflect back to our attitudes and show us what maybe is or isn't right about our presumptions at the time. And I think it's 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 really clever. Okay, so that that's the characters into the a little bit of a plot or the setup, and we'll get into the spoilers later. So effectively, we have this house party. Treves, the old solicitor, is discussing some of his old criminal cases that he's seen prosecuted, and he talks about moving towards zero. That there's the zero hour when the murder's committed, and everything leads to it. And he recalls a case of a young child who committed murder with a bow and arrow, but um, got off scot free because everyone said it was an accident. But he said he thought it was premeditated and that he would recognize that child because of a certain physical disfigurement that he would recognize now in the adult. And, he and, says, I, I, and, and we now have a, a, a cast of suspects who have physical disfigurements as well. Exactly. They've all had them pointed out. We've got Thomas Royd's gammy arm. We've got Mary Audlin's lock of hair. Um, we've got Ted Latimer's skull. You know, we've... Uh, so... And... Audrey Strange has got a scar and Neville Strange has got um, pinkies that are different sizes and things like that. So everybody's got some sort of reason why they could be a suspect. Later that day, the poor man with a bad heart um, cannot take the lift up in the hotel in which he's staying because it's supposedly out of order, has to climb up all the stairs and dies of a heart attack, which everyone thinks is an unfortunate accident. Um, And it turns out the lift wasn't really out of order, but it's kind of written off. Until poor Lady Tresillian has found a really brutal murder, sort of bludgeoned in the head in her bed. And suddenly everyone gets very, very suspicious about what really happened. Mm. So when we put these two, well, one maybe suspicious death and one certainly a murder together, the local police are called in and that's when battle starts to investigate. So we'll we'll cover the rest in the spoiler filled section. But it really is quite a tricksy kind of back and forth of who we think the suspect is. So that's kind of very satisfying. Yeah, um, she in- does. Um, she does give us plenty of reasons to suspect everybody yeah you know which we've is, got I like the love interest Leonardo's love it right because yeah. there is a lot of direction and misdirection you've really yeah. got to be on your toes on this one i think to get it did you get it did you guess you've done no, it no no yeah. but that's Me not neither. not that's not why I don't think it's top tier. <laughs> it's not because I get to beat me that I've uh, I've knocked yeah. it down a notch. <laughs> I, I, I just don't think it's as, as good as some others. So. Indeed. Okay. Well, let's let's get into adaptations before we get into the solution. So this is one of the many plays that Agatha adapted herself in 1956. Um, it was staged in the West End and then in Martha's Vineyard, interestingly. And the script was rediscovered in 2015 by Julius Green. So maybe someone will put it on again. So this is a slightly odd one in terms of sort of film TV adaptations, because it's not a Marple or Poirot to be straightforwardly in one of those series. So there was a long back and forth with the Agatha Christie estate, because at some point, a really famous like new wave French director wanted to make a French version of this. Um, and then it sort of got sort of, I don't know, went through different directors and different screenwriters and ended up with something completely different to the original intention. So the estate kind of withdrew the permission. So it's kind of inspired by, but isn't really the book. And it's, you can still watch it, actually. It's called Innocent Lies. So and and a... that's, that's really why we're doing the pod. We want Bina's movie review on Innocent Lives. <laughs> Priced Alive. I mean, you can watch it. If you just put it into YouTube, you can find the full version of the film. It's kind of like an English French co production. Um, it's incredibly nutty. It's known as the first film that Kira Knightley was in. It has, has a very short part. The Lady Tresillian character is played by Joanna Lumley, who's really camping it up. The Neville Strange character is played by Stephen Dorff from back in 1995 when he was famous. Gabrielle Unver plays um, the love interest from back when she was famous. Adrian Dunbar of The Brits Amongst You um, plays another character in it. I mean, it's, it's kind of nuts. It doesn't make any sense. There's a lot of fun to be had in seeing Stephen Dorff and Gabrielle Omar in it. Um, in terms of whether it is remotely faithful to the book, all I can say is incest plays a big part of it. Um, okay, it's just okay. completely nutty. Did you get a chance to watch it? I mean, it, no. it's absolutely nuts. <laughs> I, 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 and um, I, I was curious when I saw what you posted about it on Discord. And then I listened to the All About Agatha podcast. And uh, I think the guy said, it's like two hours of my life. I'll never get back. And I thought maybe I haven't got time to watch it. I so, think that's uh, unfair. I mean, I think it's kind of, 
if you're if you came of age in the mid 90s and you've got like you remember when Stephen Dorff was a big thing I mean there's a certain joy to it but I think you've got to approach it as a kind of like a fun silly watch I, I definitely got something out of it I'm glad I saw it but um it doesn't bear any real relevance to this because <laughs> no. it's so far removed yeah. so therefore the only sort of tv adaptation that that is relevant is the 2007 agatha christie's marple series by itv starring geraldine McEwen. and they did insert of course miss marple into a battle um series but that's okay um you have superintendent mallard rather than battle who's played by alan davis for all you arsenal fans out there host of the tuesday club and jonathan creek fans jonathan creek fans it's got an insane cast has the late lamented Julian Sands in it. Has Eileen oh, Atkins in it. It has Greg Wise in it, who I think is perfectly cast as Neville Strange because he does have that slightly caddish good look about him. So it's a really tremendous cast. I really actually, I don't often enjoy these Marples, but I really did. I think it, it just gets it really right. It's very respectful apart from having Miss Marple in it. And if that's what it took to get it made all good. But it's, I think it's really worth a watch. And it mm. is more or less faithful to the book as well. So I would... Uh, I yeah, I've not it. seen that one, but uh, um, it, that was also recommended by the All About Agatha podcast. So yeah, I think it's it's definitely one of the best of that sort of um, Geraldine McEwan series and for sure. The, the point they made about Marple over Battle was that they felt that this suited a Marple rather than a Poirot mm. because for them, Marples um, set traps to catch um, the murderers. Um, and and do the big reveal, whereas Poirot is more gets everybody around together and talks them through why wh- why there's been a murder. And this one, um, battle exposes the murderer at the end by you know forcing a confession by setting a trap. So they felt yeah. that this 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 suited a marple, you know, which, which seemed like a good explanation. Yeah, I think so. I think it works pretty well. Um, all right then, folks. We hope you have enjoyed our spoiler-free discussion of Towards Zero, and that you. Might be tempted to watch it or read it and to listen to the spoiler fill section. Um, If not, stay tuned. We will will be back next time for Sparkling Cyanide, which is an equally famous, if not more famous, novel than this. And I suspect will be a full podcast. Um, But in the meantime, whatever you're reading, we hope you're having a lot of fun with it. Thank you for listening. Okay, folks, uh, this is now the spoiler-filled section of Towards Zero, where we're going to thoroughly spoil the plot, and here we go. The key, I think, to this story is to realise that very often in Agatha Christie, the the motivation for the murder is money, um, and we're led to maybe think that might be the case here, because Lady Trisillian obviously has great wealth, and she's left it to Neville Strange and his wife, but has not specified which wife that is, so is it well, Kate Yeah, Murray? I mean, just... Uh... Uh, it, it, it's a technicality, but I, mm-hmm. I, I think it is worth bearing in mind. She, she hasn't actually, and this comes back to it being of its time. She hasn't actually been able to leave it anywhere because it's actually held in a lifetime trust mm-hmm. for her, and and the estate has to be passed uh, at her husband's bequest. I mean, I think like it's almost impossible to do this now unless you are super fabulously wealthy because the sort of the tax laws that you need to avoid are so convoluted that you need to have somebody who's full-time dedicated to it and's got a PhD in tax avoidance to be able to to get round it so um but anyway so she just has a lifetime interest um and but it the goes point to... is, is that it makes Neville strange a suspect but also both because of the ambiguity it makes yeah. both of the wives suspects so it just casts the net wide but actually, yeah. the whole thing's a complete, complete canard because the real motivation is not money, but is lust, which is the other major plot motivation in Agatha Christie. It's usually money or lust, isn't it? And what we come to realise is that there is a bit of a love triangle going on, as always, or a love quadrangle, and that Neville Strange is still v- very much in love with his wife, Audrey, well, and, yeah, but... and cannot forgive her because his yeah. ego was piqued. That actually, yeah. we think that we are led to believe that he dumped her for the younger woman, but it's not that at all. Audrey had been scared of her husband from almost the start and had been in love, not with the Mr. Royd we have here, but actually with his brother and had left Neville for him. And when Neville found out, he engineered that man's death. But that was too good for Audrey. He didn't want to just merely kill her. He wanted to punish her for her um, lack of loyalty and for her, her audacity to pass up Neville. 
So he wanted to frame her for Lady Tristillian's murder, which is why you have a very convoluted plot, which is very twisty and turny, because he has to almost first get himself accused of the murder, which he does, and then get himself acquitted by a maid very carefully um, sort of observing him leaving the house at a certain point. So he has to sort of get himself convicted, but then get himself off. And then arrange for certain pieces of evidence to be found that will frame Audrey. And this then links back to Superintendent Battle, realising that Audrey is under such pressure that she's almost just given up and admitted it, even though she didn't do it. And then to arrange for the idea that he will then uncover that Neville is really the, the little boy with the bow and arrow, who was a psychopath from the start. And I actually think that the sort of the confession and breakdown of, of Neville at the end of this novel is, is very well written. And I guess mm-hmm. it's, you know, people talk about, oh, well, there's the poison pen letter novel and there's the, you know, there's all the different types of genre, the, the sort of the closed house mystery novel. But this is the psychopath novel, right? Um, and that's why I think a lot of people like it, both for the, the convoluted misdirects of the plot, but also for the fact that they feel that in Neville Strange, you have a really fascinating portrait of a superficially well-studied English gentleman of fair play. The psychopaths, good ones, can, can really imitate that sort of behavior well. But under the surface, a little boy who feels crushed, who feels the audacity of someone daring to get away from him and will punish her in a very convoluted way. So there you go. That's the solution. Right. Um, I, I, I um, didn't, uh, that, that um, breakdown of his at the end it didn't have the impact on me. And this whole thing about him being a psychopath, I think is, I, it explains it for me and it, it makes sense. But I, I just, I don't get the chills that I get um, from other psychopaths. I think uh, um, characters like Hannibal Lecter have taken psych- psychopaths in a new direction now. So it doesn't have that element of thriller and drama that that I get. Uh, I'm almost, I'm desensitized to this. And it, when he sort of like broke down at the end, I was just like, oh, right. Okay. That, that, that's it. It didn't, it didn't, um, I mean, two things to say to that is that the, you know, there are far more psychopaths walking around us than most people realize just statistically. Most of them aren't violent killers. And Mm. if they are of violent and murderous intent, it's far more likely to show itself in this sort of quiet way than it is in the sort of the grand guignol sort of like melodramatic kind of lecture. I think the problem is, is that the understanding people have of psychopaths is Mm. so colored by like true crime and sort of these big one-off sort of serial killer type stories that actually the the genuine kind of like well not the genuine the more typical psychopath story probably does now feel rather calm and the other thing is is i think that i think you're right though i didn't find it as moving in the book but i think i'm i read back into the book i think greg wise as neville strange in the adaptation is tremendous Mm. and his breakdown scene is genuinely pitiful and moving Mm -hmm. and he does it he almost changes the voice like he's been this swaggering wimbledon champion you know macho guy and he almost becomes in his acting and his physical performance and his voice a crying seven year old, the, the mm. kid with an arrow. And it's it's a feat of acting brilliance, I think. I think it's probably one of the best single pieces of acting in any of those series. And mm. because of that, I think when I read it or when I reread it, um, I kind of read that performance into the words and it's not really in the yeah. words. Yeah. So I, this is I, one of the rare cases when I would almost say to people, don't read the novel, watch the show, because I think yeah. it's better, legitimately. No, well, I, 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 I think that, like, we, we, we've said this on more than one occasion in previous pods, there are times when um, people have taken um, this and, and dramatised it and um, evolved it beyond its original parameters in a good way. You know, mm. this is obviously an instance of that. I've not seen it, so... Um, it's it's good. The other thing that got me as well was um, the actual murder weapon. Like you were talking about that being convoluted, but the way that they piece together the murder weapon, he's taken a brass ball from a fender plate and attached a screw to it on the tennis racket handle of his wife's tennis racket. <laughs> um, and it's then, so stupid. <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, oh, my God, you know, uh, like what, what what is all this? But I think that the other thing that, um, I, I felt that the, the the reason that this suffered as a story, battle is just not. It, it it's our our word of the year. He's not got any riz like Quarrel. <laughs> he, 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 he doesn't grab you, and he, he just plods through it. And again, it might be Christie's just playing with the form, but 
Um, I think, uh, and I'm going to be quite critical here, maybe unfairly, I think um, Agatha has been a bit lazy. I would imagine that it, it's probably quite tricky to write, write Poirot. She has to come up with these humorous little lines and 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 and, and be engaging, entertaining, and um, intelligent. She, he has to have you know something that sets him apart because he is almost superhuman. Whereas Battle is is the complete opposite. He gets there just through his dogged determination and his relentless plodding. So she can just write him very matter of factly, and yeah, it's it, just, it, just not an entertaining read. So I agree, I agree. But let's get into the let's get into the plot because I find this so incredible and laughably stupid. I don't understand why people think this is a good bit. Uncovering okay. the plot re- requires Angus McWhirter, whatever his name is. Our poor little guy, who just happens to be back in the village, getting the wrong jacket that belonged to someone else uncleaned from the dry cleaners. And it has a certain smell and the stains have an odd pattern. And getting this random jacket is what causes him to realise what really happened. I find this so creaky as a plot point. And then I find the fact that the murderer is going to be like swimming across the kind of the the gulf of the ocean and then climbing up the rope, up the cliff, like the man, what was that old ad from the 80s? The man with the box of black magic chocolates, all all because the lady loved milk, loves milk tray. And then he's going to then get into the house and roll up that rope, which is now damp from the seawater, and put it in the dusty attic, and then change into his nice new suit, and bash in the lady's head, and then hide the fendery bit, and then make sure he leaves the house of the maid. I mean, come on, there's easier ways to, to, to I mean, to get revenge on your, your ex-wife, surely. I mean, it's just it's also laughably unbelievable. Yeah, so, I, I know, but what, what, once we're revealed to it, it does narrow the, the, the list of suspects down to one because there's only one person who's physically capable of doing all those things. Well, I'm not sure even like, the best athletes physically capable really of doing all that. But anyway, I mean, to me, as soon as it was like, oh, you got some wrong dry cleaning, that's what motivates the plot. I was just like, I'm out. I'm bugging out at this point. And then right. to sort of like, and then to wind up at the end when poor Audrey's like, yes, I've never met you before, but I'm going to go to Chile with you and get married. I was just like... Come on, Agatha, you write these amazing female characters and you're so proto-feminist for your time. And now you're going to have poor Audrey, who was married to a total psychopath and scared for him the whole time. Is she really going to ju- and just, just found out that this guy was gunning for her? So she must have some kind of trauma from realising that she was framed up by her ex. And she's going to literally just jump into the arms of some bloke she met a couple of days ago and go to Chile. I mean, well, come on! Like, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, but Agatha does do this at times. She does have these weak, um, overly sentimental endings that we, we sort of like. It's just sort of look Poirot, at isn't it? All my little yeah, kids must be married. Maybe it doesn't, it doesn't hold up. The method of the murder and the plot being convoluted, I, I'm far more forgiving of. Uh, uh, like I, I, I it, it, it's a work of fiction, and it, uh, you know uh, oh, how I get to get it to work. I get to get to work. It really so. like that. But people are saying this is top tier Agatha. I don't think you can be top tier Agatha and have plot forgiven. I think it's got to be legitimately good, and we know she can do legitimately ironclad, really cool Trixie plot. This isn't it, yeah. And therefore, to me, it's not top tier. I don't understand yeah. why people think it is. Well, I, 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 I could, I could admit something to top tier if I felt it had um, a, 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 something that gave it an element that lifted it above it. Like um, for me, Sad Cypress, the edge yes. it had was it had more humour in it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and evil under the sun. Um, I just found the characterization of the female characters superb. Agreed. So there's no two Agreed. other ways. But five little pigs. Um, I would say that had got all the elements that ticked all the boxes. That's why mm. that's good. You know. So um, it's got an edge. And this one just it doesn't. It's got it's good. It's average. It's mediocre all the way through. Um, and it's got a few downsides that sort of like switch it off. So it's it, it's average rather than exceptional, but I do think there's something in what you say about it being her psychopath novel. I think the 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 the, the, the Christie aficionados um, love it because it, it ticks that psychopath box, and maybe they've watched that adaptation that you're talking about. So the the revelation at the end has a lot of impact, but mm. um, for me it just felt a bit flat. And I, I think um, battle unless we've got a detective who is engaging. Um, What's like Marvel or Poirot, you, you know, it, it's just a lot more difficult to follow for me, you know, and buy into. I agree with everything you said, actually. 
So maybe we should hold to our promise that this would not be to need more than an hour and we'll end it there. And hopefully the listener will now understand why we it's not that we don't think this is a good book. It's definitely in the top half, but it, to us, it's not in the top quarter, maybe. And um, it's not top tier. And we disagree no. with with some of the fanboys out there who think it's amazing. I think it's just part of society's obsession with an, a glamorizing of psychopaths, honestly. I think as human beings, we need to get over it. Um, mm. <laughs> I've never, I, I've never thought about it in that much detail. To be honest, it, 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 it's something that I don't, um, I'm not drawn to. Like my brother loves it. You know, he's fascinated by all this stuff, um, and he, he, you know, he finds it riveting. And he's like, "Oh, you've got to read this book on Ted Bundy." And you've got, I, I, I find it too horrific. You know, to sort of like look into the, the evil that people will do to other people. Uh, it, 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 I, I prefer not to confront it because it's um it, it's just too horrifying, really. So. I agree, but I must admit I am a charter member of the Battles of King's Kingsgrave Sicko Psycho Serial Killers. Yeah, one of, one of the few <laughs> channels I've muted. I'm afraid. <laughs> Where we all gather together and pour over some of these true crime tales and yeah, get into of late the jet. Well, I think um, F T Ward has definitely gotten me into the. A, a multi-decade now obsession with the JFK assassination as well. So all of you out there who do love obsessing about true crime and whether it's serial killers, psychopaths or government conspiracies involving MK Ultra, then you will find your home. And that's the beautiful thing about Vogue. It's it's a broad church and there's a there's a Discord channel for everyone's crazy nerdy interests. That is uh, true. That is true. <laughs> but I don't think this book is really, really part of that. And um yeah, maybe that's to the good, actually. I don't think that's Agatha Christie's natural home. But for all of those reasons that we've discussed, maybe not top tier. But no, thank definitely. you very much for persuading me to do a full podcast. This is, as always, it's been a pleasure to discuss this with you. As we've said on the Discord, it, it's just, it's maybe it's disappointing it hasn't got more to commend it to people. But anyway, I agree. we move. Anyway, we'll, 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 we'll join together next time and hopefully listeners will join along with Sparkling Cyanide, which I think is definitely more meritorious and, but has worse adaptations, which I have yet to rewatch. <laughs> I'm, I'm holding, for, <laughs> nothing's going to be Innocent Lies. I mean, that was just gonzo in all sorts of crazy ways um but anyway thank you everyone for listening thank you pat for joining and i hope you all have yep. a great great thanks evening. very much for hosting again bina no problem and-